Well, good morning, all. Um, this is uh, Pat Mallon. Um, I'm. Uh, it's. I show 10:01 a.m. So we will um, do a roll call and call a meeting to order. Chris Childs here. Um, Brenda Brunner. Present. Liam Magoski. Rosa Ramos. Here. Sheriff Braun. Here. Steve uh, Hadfield. Chris Heron. Present. Chief Elise Warren. Chief Andrew White. Okay, I show that we do have six members of the authority uh, online and that constitutes a quorum. So the first order of business is approval of the minutes from our February 21st meeting. Is there a motion? Make to the motion. Is there a second? Ron the second. I'm sorry, who was that? Sheriff Ron. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Chief uh, Childs? Affirm. Uh, Brenda Brunner? Aye. Aye. Leanne Magoski? She's shown up. Aye. Sheriff here. Braun? Rosa's here. Rosa's here. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a motion on the, on the floor to approve the minutes from our February 20th. Do you have a vote, ma'am? Aye. Uh, Sheriff Braun. Aye. Aye. Sheriff Ayub. Chief Hatfield, has he joined us? Aye. Uh, Chief Elise Warren. Still absent. Chief Andrew White. Also absent. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item number three, waiting to the closed session. So we'll leave this meeting and we'll come back. So for those of you that are not on the the authority, uh, please. All right, well, let's, I'm going to go ahead and call roll again, see if the board has been able to rejoin. So Chief Chris Childs. Chief Childs, I see you listed, but I don't hear your voice. We'll come back to him in just a minute. Brenda Brunner. Present. I see you. Present. Um, Leanne Magoski. I see you. Present. Uh, Sheriff Braun. Here. Sheriff Here. Ayub. Uh, has Chief Hatfield joined us? Nope. Present. Chris Heron? Uh, Chief Elise, Chief Andrew White? Still absent. Chief Childs, have you been able to join us? I see his name, but not his uh, voice. Uh, a quorum, so we can go ahead and move ahead. So next item on the agenda is a legislative update from Mr. Salvador. You're you're very very low in volume. Can you please move closer to your mic? How's this? Okay. Even though I feel closer. Well, it just. A... Okay. How about this? Uh, yeah, that'll work. It's still it's still weak, but we can hear you. Okay. Well, uh, this this thing will also be provided. to touch upon some state and federal bills that are at play in the sort of this two-year session, both on the state side as well as the federal side. Uh, so currently we're tracking AB 988 by Assemblymember Bauer Cahan, which would establish that nine in compliance with the existing federal law and standards governing the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And uh, the bill would require Cal OES to take specified actions to implement the hotline system. This hotline center or centers to provide crisis intervention services and crisis care coordination to individuals accessing 988. Uh, additionally, AB 1. Uh, sorry, AB 1100 by Assembly Member or disaster related state of emergency or local emergency declared by the governor requires the PPC to collect specified information from telecommunication service providers related to the provider's efforts to repair or replace communications infrastructure that was damaged. So, required that the information collected from telecom service providers by the CPUC be broken down by each emergency or disaster and be submitted in a report to the CPUC as well as to the appropriate policy committees of the legislature. Senator Dodd, uh, which would Define a de-energization event as a planned power outage as specified and would make a de-energization event one of those conditions constituting a local emergency. And then lastly, on the state side, SB 341 by Senator McGuire would to maintain on its internet website a public outage map showing that providers outages and would require uh, OES in consultation with the CPC to adopt by regulation requirements for those maps as specified. 
The bill would also require OES to provide the CQC with all of the information it provided to isolation outage notification and to aggregate that data and post that data on the internet. On the uh, federal side, we have HR 1250, which would require the FCC to report on certain activations of DERS or the Disaster Reporting Information Reporting System and to adopt also HR 1848 by uh, Congressman, Congressman Poloni that would rebuild and modernize the nation's infrastructure to expand access to broadband as well as drinking water infrastructure, modernize the electric grid and energy supply infrastructure, redevelop brownfields, and then strengthen healthcare infrastructure to protect public health and the environment. Uh, that also includes some uh, grant funding for Next Gen 911. Uh, Congressman Smith uh, would authorize the Secretary of Health and Human Services, acting through the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, to award grants to states, territories, political subdivisions, and unarmed 911 response programs. And then also uh, Senate Bill 466 by Senator Moran, which again is the Kelsey Smith Act, would require mobile or uh, VoIP providers to this quest. But specifically, the provider must disclose information at the request of an investigative or law enforcement officer if the officer asserts that the device was used and that the device is in possession of an individual who is in an emergency situation. And then lastly, Senate Bill 1175 is the 911 Saves Act by Senator Burr, which would categorize public safety telecom telecommunicators as a critical classification. So these are some of the bills that we'll be tracking uh, through, through the remainder of the session, and we'll be providing this to you as board members uh, on adjournment of today's meeting. Uh, I'll be also. Thank you, uh, Mr. Salvador. Uh, does the board have any questions of? Okay, hearing none, we will move on to item number five, which is a branch report. All right, thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna go through the, the normal briefing order here and I uh, really want to encourage you to, um, if you have a question, just let me know. I can see all the board members on my screen. So if you just raise your hand, don't, don't with our call stats. Obviously these are from 2020. They have not changed. Um, you know, the trend here is just an upward tick in wireless uh, calls, which we're continuing to see year after year. It's going up in the statistics for quite some time. Um, this is our CPE installation. I have a couple of slides later on where we're at with CPE. Uh, the numbers are, are low for 2021 because of a couple of reasons. We're early in the year. And also we've had some challenges with um, CPE compliance. And so we've had to put a couple of freezes on the sale of new CPE. And uh, that's really what's contributing to these low numbers. And I could said I've got a lot more detail on this throughout the presentation. We know that in order to connect a 911 center needs to be needs a software upgrade um, in, in every single case. And for Motorola, if you have a Motorola system, we're updating those to 7.4 Service Pack 1. And for Viper, um, we've suspended those sales. There's some testing we're working on and some validate before we authorize any additional sales of that equipment. And we have had some problems with Viper 7.0, and we're, we're not going to be anybody, uh, we were, we're not moving anyone to that version until we fully tested that in our lab. There are a few um, the PSAP gateway. Um, we did a, a really thorough analysis of this to see the pros and cons of a PSAP gateway. Uh, we talked to other states and vendors who have done deployments in other states. And, and the bottom line is a PSAP gateway introduces the equipment. So our preference is, is obviously not to install that gateway unless we absolutely have to. So we're working with CallWorks and Central Square and Zetron to see if we can get a solution for them that does not require. If you have very, very old equipment, um, you know, installed prior to 2000, oh, probably 2010 or 2007, really old, there's about 80 out there. Um, that older equipment will probably still need a legacy PSAP gateway. That's that's the one drawback. We're looking at ways to, to just upgrade that PSAP to cloud uh, as soon as possible. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on where we are with the cloud-based CPE deployment. What's gonna have to happen at every PSAP in addition to the software upgrade, we have to program line appearance on how to use those line appearances. And um, due to the changes that are coming from next gen 911, there are some differences. We've been messaging this at, at all of our outreach meetings, but we just want to put it out here. I know I've mentioned it before, uh, it has to be completed and there are some, some changes that are coming. The good news is, is that the CP vendor is required to support all of your existing interfaces. So this isn't impacting the interfaces, this is just the, the different look and from one call comes in and that's part of our training. So I'll pause here and, and see if there's any questions on what we're doing with CPE upgrades and, and how this process is going. 
If you're wondering how many of these have been completed, I, I, I want to say the number's around 70 PSAPs. I've had a CP uh, software upgrade. Um, I think that's the number out of the four, you know, making progress, but um, this, this is not moving as fast as, as what we would like. Text. Good news with text. Um, we've been talking about this a long time. I would like to say we're fully deployed, but you see that little two there in uh, PSAPs pending? There are two PSAPs in the state that we cannot get around, and that's required under the, the, the legacy model of this. So we're working on that. It's a physical limitation of, of at the PSAP. So one is in uh, Sonora, uh, which if you've ever been there, it's not a really large metropolis. Uh, and the, uh, you know, into the entrance of Yosemite, you'll realize how rural that area is. Once we get those IP connections in, we, you know, we will bring them online as well. Um, thankfully, those are, are very um, small um, uh, coverage areas. So the rest of the state, uh, everybody is taking text today. On this slide, because our next step in the process is to transition everybody off of our existing contract that ends uh, in March. Well, I think it's April of 2022. Our existing text contract goes away and we can we're looking at, at ways to do that um, with the limited amount of time we have left in, in the, the year and uh, looking at, a, at a, um, options. We certainly want to maintain the current posture we have, where if you have integrated, you stay in to uh, rapid deploy, who will be the over-the-top vendor working with Atos. If we run into a time crunch where we cannot do the integrated because of CPE limitations and testing and everything else, We'll look at alternate scenarios as, as to stay on this path. But uh, in August, I'll give you a more thorough update of where we are based on timelines and what's realistic to make the transition. Um, so just stay tuned for that. But certainly if you're a, a, a web-based over-the-top solution today, you, you will be transitioning to that and, and keep that. But a lot of that could be out of our control. It might be in the hands of the CPE vendor. And, and we've got contracts and legislative mandates we have to comply with. So more to follow on that. Uh, any questions about text? All right, I really want to thank Sharice for her hard work on this. Um, she has been amazing. Um, and also our, um, our our regional coordinators. So, you know, Ella and Cindy and and, uh, and getting this project to completion. So without Sharice, we wouldn't have text to 911. So just thank you, Sharice, for all your hard work. It's really, really been uh, an amazing effort. Yeah, Brenda, I, I, I did have, have a question, question. about ahead. the transition from the web base over the top. So you mentioned that if you currently have that, you're going to go to resolution at that point, that's going to be compatible with the next gen system, or is it still going to present as a kind of a web-based extra screen? And that's a great so question, Brenda. Thank you. Yeah, it will be on uh, an extra screen, just like it is now. The call will be routed through next gen 911, but it'll be displayed on that rapid deploy screen is, is where the text session so, will come in. It's not going to be connected any way with the wireless location yes. accuracy. Yeah, it, it'll be all integrated into that too. same rapid deploy dashboard, single pane of glass. It'll be right in that same tool. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yeah, great question. Okay. So moving on from text, um, we're going to go through NextGen 911. And again, we're in this part of the project where we're doing the installs. We're trying to integrate our carriers, or originating service providers. Uh, we're doing a test and integration, and then we're talking about. We've updated the schedule. That's the first thing you're going to see. Uh, we were the last time we met, we were saying optimistically, and and some some would claim I was I'm overly optimistic, which is probably true. But you've heard of people who talk about it. But there's anything in it, so I see things a little differently. So my schedules have always been optimistic, um, but really we're seeing that it's going to take us a year to make this transition, and and because of everything we're seeing with CPE limitations, that when we went to go live at our first first piece app, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and what we learned, we realized it's going to be into June of 2022 before we're completed. Now, we're still in alignment with um, what to do through our budget uh, change process that we went through. And, uh, and so we've got to be finished by the end of 2022. So we, so we still have time on that timeline. Um, but there's reasons why we would like to go as fast as possible as we're not, we're not talking so much about dates anymore. It seems like every time I pick a date and, and put a, a, a stand in the ground, um, the date moves. So... There's a lot of contingencies in this project. I'm gonna go over those and, and tell you why we've arrived at where we are on, on the next couple of time. We've been using this to um, talk about the various um, contingencies within the project. So there's some work that the CPE vendor needs to do that's shown in blue. There's some work that the next gen 911 service providers need to do, the barriers. And this little green box on the side here, this is all the preparations we have to make in order to make sure that you're, you're ready on the day we migrate the first carrier over. So Remember that this whole thing is centered on, we make sure you can answer a 911 environment and then we move the carriers over from legacy to next gen. That's, that's the vision 
uh, and the plan that we're using. So how do we get there? We know that you've asked us, where are we in this process? You know, when is my PSAP going to be online? What's the status of an internal PSAP, PSAP uh, tracking spreadsheet? It's got uh, 80 columns, 450 rows, a lot of data in it. And it's too big to share. And, it, and it, it's, it's information that we, we really don't want out there for everybody because it, we've taken that spreadsheet and we've developed an interactive tool that gives the status of your specific PSAP. So I'm going to stop sharing these slides and I'm going to attempt if it demo of what that dashboard looks like. Um, so let me make sure the dashboard is set up properly. Stop that, All right? So can everybody see that screen? Everybody seeing that? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through what this is. Now, this is going to be a public-facing uh, dashboard. We, we want to be completely transparent in where we are in the project. Data that couldn't be shared publicly. Um, so, so we've done that. What you see on this side of the screen is a way to filter for your specific PSAP. Okay, so I'll get to that in a second. This here is a sudden scroll down through this information and take a look at all the details about each of, of the, the PSAPs that are in here. The information in this pane is those PSAPs that, and jurisdictions that have submitted GIS data. This is, we have some, some uh, gauges that show how far we are in the completion process. Right now, I don't have a filter on, so I'm showing you statewide stats at this point. This validated with uh, NG91 transfer list, that means that we've validated in next gen, whether it's 10 digit, another PSAP, whatever. We validated that and that's in there. The CPE upgrade, that's where CPE line appearances have been done. We've done the programming and we've completed the training for your PSAP. That's that gate. Equipment associated with your region provider has been installed. And then you've got Autos equipment. Um, now, please don't, don't think that Autos is going much slower than the region. Remember, Autos can't install until the region does first. So there's always a little lag, but is an indicator of how many PSAPs are, are at that go live moment. In other words, you've integrated CPE with Next Gen 911 and they're ready to start taking Next Gen 911 calls. It's not an indicator that they're live in 911 yet. It just means they're ready. So let me show what we're looking at. So I'm going to search for Tuolumne County Sheriff. If I can type, I will. All right, Tuolumne. And then in that transfer cluster, we also know that there are three other PSAPs we're looking at. Sonora PD, so I'll put them in there. There's a CAL FIRE in uh, Merced, which is also referred to as Atwater. And there's a, um, I mean, a CHP in, in Merced. And then there's um, a, uh, a CAL FIRE San Andreas. All right, so I have four PSAPs in, the, in this little cluster that I'm looking at. You can see all the gauges update and show those PSAPs. So you as a PSAP, you can go in and look at yours. You can look at your neighbors. If you want to see how the rest of the set, the, the gauges update accordingly. We got some feedback from the LRPC yesterday. We're going to add over here in this left pane an explanation of what you're looking at and, and a quick little, here's how you use the tool. And we'll have this tool available for all PSAPs next week. So I'll pause there and in here. All right, I really want to thank our GIS team. So Natasha is the supervisor in that group and Amanda and Sam and Nicole, they're the ones who, who did the work um, that you're seeing here. And we, we think this is just a really good way to continue to be transparent of where we are with uh, the project. Jim, just okay. because I don't want the hard work to not be acknowledged at the advisory board. We saw this yesterday at the LRPC, not trying to still curse this thunder, but um, you know um, what's going on and, if you're, and, if, and um, we like the transparency and appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Leanne, I appreciate that. Okay, like I said, we'll send this out. Uh, this tool is going to be available, um, and we certainly can make modifications to it and, and improve it, but we think this is a really good uh, first step. Okay, so I'm going to switch back over to the uh, PowerPoint, if you'll give me a second here. Transparency of where we are with the deployment process. So um, that's a that's current status of where we are. Now, <clears throat> we learned some more things when we went to uh, go live in Tuolumne. Uh, we needed to improve the testing and validation process. So we put a lot with you. We got a lot of good feedback on, hey, we need this training. We need the ability to test this. We need the ability to do this. Um, we need this comfort level before we're ready to go live. And so we hear that. Um, we also realized that each carrier has a very distinct others, but there's certain hoops we've got to go through for each carrier. So we realized that we're going to need your help, the help of the PSAPs out there to support this. Um, and we also know that you as a PSAP probably have some testing that's unique to your needs to check and validate. So we've updated our process to accommodate these. And also we know that our CPE has some limitations on some of the CPE, um, their ability to support Nina I3. And I'm gonna talk about those in a second. So what we did 
was, you know, we, we started um, realizing their process and we knew that we could only test so much in the lab. Everything we can, we are, we're testing. Uh, but really carriers are requiring that call to be landed next step. They don't consider the lab environment as, as checking that box. So, and they give, you know, specific um, test windows. So what we're asking for is um, PSAP is able to answer next gen 911 calls, your line appearances are in, your CPE is in, you're integrated to next gen. We want to establish some deliberate test windows at your PSAP. And we, we had uh, outreach meetings. Um, like I said, we'll do as much as we can to test it. We know your CPE technician is going to test it locally, but there's, there's just, we need you as a dispatcher to be able to look at this and, and it meets your needs at the PSAP level. So we're asking to establish specific test windows, Monday to Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we're going to limit the number of calls that are landed during that time. And we'll validate that was sort of a statewide, if you're going to test for next gen, here's your window. And we've talked to the PSAPs and we have a deliberate process in place. Now, if you get busy, you've got a planned event, uh, you can certainly contact your project manager and tell them, okay, you can, or on the day of something's going um, you know, wonky uh, in, in your area where uh, you're getting an influx of calls and you can't handle any test calls. We understand that too. Staffing shortages, whatever the reason is, you have the ability to stop. You had this. And then the other thing we're building in is we're going to give your own test number for you to do your testing. So once we're done, you can then validate your own process. You'd simply dial a number and it will ring into your PSAP um, so that you can transfer to an A need to do. Those are some things that we're putting in place now that admittedly have impacted the timeline and pushed things out a little bit, but we know they're important. And so we're making that effort. So I'm going to pause here because that's a lot about see if there's any feedback or questions from the board. Budge, I have a question. It's Rosa. Yes. In re so for secondary PSAPs, how do you envision the testing to go? Obviously, like for us, when we had to test um, text to 911, we have to dial 911 from here and then ask um, Brenda Perez over here. It, are we still going to have to, are other primary PSAPs going to take that burden also or that load of testing when secondaries have so to also test? That's a great test? question, Rosa. I think, and I'm not going to, everyone's going to be scared on my team right now, but I think we might be able to direct a call straight to a secondary PSAP. Let me ask that because I think that would be very helpful, calls into you, and that seems a little clunky to me. Yeah. So let me ask if we can direct um, a call straight into a secondary PSAP so you can do your own testing. I, I think Thank that would you. be a lot better. Yeah. I'm glad Andrew's not in the office today because he can't run down here and choke me out from saying that, so that's good. All right, any other feedback? Because that's really good. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about your CPE. And I want to be careful here because this is not a, a CPE bashing slide. That's not the intent of this. But there's some realities here that, that we just need to be in it. And it performs very well in the legacy environment. And that's really what it was designed to test and built toward. And then they put in this I3 capability with the intent of supporting I3 when it came along. Well, we just happen to be the first ones where it's coming along. And so with Nina I3. And we're learning that there's some things the CPE just can't do today. Now it's on their roadmaps, they're working toward development, but as we plan implementation and transition, we have to really accommodate these IP version six, which uses the machine address uh, along with some other attributes to determine routing, which is different than IPv4. And we are also using what's called uh, TLS or transport layer security and a machine address of, of, of the devices in the network are given a certificate. And as the packet passes through, um, that certificate is validated and, and it has to be supported in order to deliver those calls today. Um, like I said, they're working on it, they're, they're just not quite there. We also need a unique IP address to do something that, that's called dereferencing a, 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 a NINA I3 call. So that real quickly, this when a call comes over, so think of it like when you type in www.google.com, that google.com gets resolved to an IP address that travels through the internet to wherever that server is, returns back the information you want. Same thing happens here. You read that domain name, dereference it, go get the location, bring the location data in, make a routing decision, send the call to the right PSAP. When it gets to the PSAP, the way it's supposed to work is they're supposed to dereference that same domain and go out and figure out the location. CPE needs a unique IP address. They don't have one. So the, they'll tell you, well, hey, we can do this at a PSAP. Yep, they can do it at a PSAP. I need to do it at 450 PSAPs. So I need unique limitations. 
Other limitations like position state, element state, queue state, we've talked about before in this board. Um, these are needed to support some of the dynamic policy routing. Um, we know that uh, those are needed and those are a future um, deployment. Videos, photos, multimedia, um, most of those can't be supported by uh, the current CPE that's installed in California. And many of them are also limited in their I3 logging. So we've built in workarounds in the system to accommodate these, but the, the, they're really adding significant time on the deployment. That, that's what all this is working around. So we know the real solution to this is to move to this data center cloud-based CPE model that we've developed and get you using those vendors that are on that new Chrome. You know, we have to, to really deal with this reality. We're recommending that PSAPs wait to replace their CPE if they at all possibly can. Because if you buy CPE today, environment, um, it, it, we're, you know, we don't know how long it will take current versions of CPE to be upgraded to support all this, or even if they ever will. So this is just the reality of what we're dealing with, with our call processing equipment that's out there in CalFERC. Uh, we will get it to work. It's just not going to do everything we need it and, and want it to do until we move to that new contract. So any questions on that? I know that was a lot of technical stuff, but I uh, apologize. We want to just really let you know what we're seeing out there. Budgets, uh, Chris Heron, have a question yes. regarding this. So fast forward two years uh, post next gen 911 go live, hopefully across the state. And if we do have PSAPs at that point that have CPE that maybe got procured last year or the year before. So in other words, it'll, it will at that point be less than five years old. Have you guys started to talk about what that might look like in a, a transition, an earlier transition to the cloud-based? Yeah, Chris, that's a great question. We have, and aside from the one-time cost to put in the new equipment, um, the monthly recurring cost um, in the new model is actually less. So if we can find the budget to make those transitions, if we can. Obviously, there's certain priorities of folks that have been waiting to buy a new CPE. We've got to get them done first. There's others we're seeing some outages and outage trends that we're trying to, to mitigate. But once we get through those in the process, turning uh, the machine, we'll probably be able to do 100 a year. So we got those limitations to deal with. But yes, after we get through that, we've started to talk about what does it look like for folks who might not yet be at the end of their contract? Is there a way to transition? Them? Budge to add, yeah. to add on to that, and I don't know that you have the numbers, but it would be interesting to hear at a future um, board meeting, is how many agencies have um, postponed the purchase of their CPE waiting for uh, model pricing versus the traditional CPE, the new contract versus the old contract? Because if you can only do 100 a year, Obviously, if it's more than 100, which I assume it is, I think we need to, you know, be cons be consistent and and figuring out, you know, what's best. I know a lot of a lot of the large agencies are going to be a beast to switch over no matter what. Um, so it would okay. be interesting. We'll put those together. I'll have a graphic for you next time on how many uh, PSAPs are in each of those years. So my team is probably scrambling right now. Um, like, oh, we got to put those numbers together right here uh, next time. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we just want to make sure you understand there's different testing we're doing. There's CPE testing or CPE vendors doing. Um, there's next-gen 911 testing that our vendors are doing to validate the next-gen is working. There's go-live testing, which is really validating that integration. Was that done? Calls are landing on your CPE as test calls before you actually uh, go live. Um, and then those carrier testing could have to be done carrier by carrier. Um, each one uh, may want to validate that they're able to land a call. So we worked to um, uh, develop a, uh, a training a supplement to support next gen 911 and uh, Paul has sent that out so all the PSAPs have that because we realized that that there's a lot of training that needs to have any specific concerns reach out to your next gen project manager reach out to your PSAP advisor and we'll talk through the various scenarios that are out there uh, and concerns because you know with that are at different stages uh, throughout the state all right um so when when can you expect to get calls well when the line appearances are there and you've had your training and you've, and you've seen us deliver next gen 911 test calls through next gen 911, it's at that point that those test windows that we call your PSAP. And every PSAP is gonna be on a different schedule. And that tracker um, dashboard that I showed you before will give you an indication as to where you are in that process and when you can expect to start receiving. All right, these slides we're not gonna show anymore because I have to put these slides together about 30 days before I, I brief the board. And they're always old data by the time we or we'll start using that as the, uh, the instant in time um, that, that provides this status. But you can see, if those of you that are remembering and you saw back, we're about 74% complete with Autos installations. The circuit installations are, are making their way through as well. So if you look in the north, the company there is Synergym. In the south, the company is Lumen. And then in the central part of the state uh, in LA, those are NGA 911, and you can see we're making progress there as well. 
there's a lot of moving parts here and I really want to give credit to the project managers um, that are doing this. So uh, Sharice and Kurt and Tiffany and Angela and Ann are really, you know, carrying the brunt of this and um, they're not even letting me go to meetings anymore. They're like, you're done. It's all designed. Let us go figure out how to make it work and uh, implement it. So we're at that part in the project, which is pretty exciting. Our transition schedule stays the same. It's just when we, this graphic has not changed. These are names of selective routers. So if you're looking for your PSAP, your PSAP name won't be there. These are the selective routers that exist in the state as we work through our transition. And we're hoping to start in June uh, with that first phase. We want to make sure there's some procedures in place before we go live, and then we'll continue through the rest of the state. And it's all going to be contingent on the success of that first phase. Because like I said, we, we want to get this right. And there's a lot of eyes on this process. We also want to let you know any switching over to making sure that we deliver a reliable, fully capable solution that meets your operational needs. That's our number one focus. And as you go through each phase, it's going to take two, three, four, maybe five months to get through a single phase. And you could be accepting calls like months uh, before we can finish every single carrier transition in your PSAP. And we've tested all those scenarios and everything to make sure that it works. We're also focused on security. We want to make sure that this system is secure. Um, I've, I've talked a little bit about the security already. Uh, everything's routing over encrypted IPv6 connections. We're using this public key infrastructure. Um, they call it a zero trust network, if you understand that, that concept. Um, we're actively monitoring for denial of service and telephone denial of service. <clears throat> Keep in mind, those are very tricky because they're actual 911 calls. The way you do a telephone denial of service is you dial 911. All that comes in if it's you know, a denial of service call or a real call. So we have to uh, be careful on how we monitor for that in the network. We've hired a company called NetForce to come in and do a, a third-party cybersecurity assessment of the net, network, identify gaps, and recommend cybersecurity enhancements. We also work very closely with our state threat assessment center, uh, and we're participating in all the national groups, whether it's NIST or, or the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Cyber Secure. So we're doing everything on our side uh, to, to analyze that. All right. That's really it on NextGen. Anything you want, any, any other details you guys need on NextGen 911, where we are in the deployment, questions you have, concerns? I just had a, a quick comment. Um, just regarding the, the security, I think it's great that, you know, all the, the technology that you guys are leveraging and really from the private sector where we've seen this stuff proven an incredibly complex project and impacts different people, but it's nice to see that technology because I think that is one of the greater threats, especially as we move to um, cloud-based CPE and, you know, a whole bunch of agencies being on it because it's a much bigger target, uh, you know, for attackers and so forth. Thank you, Chief White. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's something that we've really spent a lot of time talking about internally, and we haven't, you know, so much discussed it on these calls, but um, we wanted to put it front and center today to make sure that you knew we're tracking this, we're in party to help us make sure we didn't overlook anything. What, um, as far as the closed session reports on outages, is this something that in the future as the network goes live that you would see reporting on in terms of like when we are getting hit or just Absolutely. to get a sense of kind we'll of- We'll be talking about cybersecurity and what we're seeing in terms of cybersecurity. Yeah. Okay, location accuracy project. Um, I'm, I'm gonna mention a couple of things here. Uh, we're using rapid deploy for this solution and we chose them uh, you know, a few years ago because we needed a, a, an ability to get uh, quickly, I don't wanna use rapidly, quickly deploy this, this tool. Um, it includes uh, SMS text from 911. It's, that's been available for about a year. Uh, and we've already talked about how we're going to be migrating over the top solution. So if you're an over the top PSAP and you're not using Rapid Deploy, we're recommending that it is on May 26th. Um, Rapid Deploy will also be providing OnStar data uh, integrated into the tool. So this will show up. There's training sessions. Um, you know, your PSAP has access to that. Uh, Leah has some messaging what that OnStar data is going to do, how it will show up. Um, the audio portion of that 911 call will get to your PSAP the way it does today. Uh, and then ultimately into the future, uh, we will then be able to route that audio through next gen 9. Um, this is an important part of the strategy for delivering supplemental data to the PSAP. And it's the only way we have to get the data to every PSAP. You individually are making choices, we realize, to get this data maybe in other ways, but for, uh, I guess what you could call emerging technologies and being able to integrate them into the PSAP. So really excited about this OnStar uh, delivery that's coming uh, next week. So pretty excited about that. I, this slide's been up for almost a year now. So uh, these are our cloud-based vendors. I'm keeping the slide in here in case you want to go back and reference it. You can quickly get to it. And what we're doing now, we've met with these vendors and we're, we're building out better. We've got another one that's going to be coming in soon to start their testing. 
And we've completed the work in the lab to be able to do the testing and integration with all of our next-gen 911 providers. They're listed there, Atos, Lumen, NGA, and Synergym. Um, so we're ready on our side, and now we're in their connections into the lab, get that established so we can start building that testing capability uh, for these cloud-based CPU solutions. When we get somebody to that point, we will let you know. We'll let you know who the vendor is, where they're at in the testing process, and, and a lot more interest in this in the next few months um, because, you know, we're, we're ready. The PSAPs are ready. It's time to get this stuff vetted and validated in the lab. I'll finish up with a, a Setna. Our current budget year is uh, going to be ending uh, next month, um, and uh, this fund condition statement will update at that time. This has been the same for about a year. And tell you that based on what we're tracking, uh, in terms of revenue coming in, expected revenue coming in as a result of this slide, which is the uh, surcharge of 30 cents, the revenue is either at or above what we expected them to be within our budget allocation. So the fund is healthy um, and we have the resources that we need to accomplish everything that we've been asked to do. So um, really, this is just great news around this space for a, a number of years. Know that that's not what we were saying even just a couple of years ago. So thank you for all your support on that. Uh, we're, we're being very... Um, uh, we're administering the fund in a way that's fiscally responsible. I'll let you know that internally in my test, uh, he'll be heading up our fiscal unit, and we're super excited about him coming in and being able to really uh, keep a handle on this fund and manage this for us. So we, we're, we're really, uh, really fortunate that we have the resources we need to accomplish the mission. So with that, Pat, I think Thank you I'll, much. I'll are there any questions from any from uh, the board or from those that are participating? Hearing none, we will move on to the Long Range Planning uh, Committee report from Mr. Good morning, Hero. thank you. Since the last uh, advisory board meeting, the LRPC has held two meetings. One was in April and then one yesterday. Uh, we continue to receive regular updates and provide feedback to the state advisory board. Um, specifically, we did have updates yesterday from all of the NextGen 911 regional working groups, as well as the GIS working group. They all met earlier this month um, where they were uh, and that's a good cross-section, as you recall, from, from PSAPs across the state, small, large, um, primary, secondary. And so uh, they continue to work with uh, Budge and his team providing feedback. Uh, as was mentioned, we uh, saw the next-gen deployment uh, dashboard that uh, Budge shared with us, and we were able to provide some feedback that they're going to implement. And then one thing that, that wasn't discussed yet, but uh, we had a preliminary discussion yesterday with, with Budge, and that was uh, the sharing of the state 9-1 branches working on a strategic plan. And so uh, we went over sort of the the high level topics that, um, that are envisioned uh, being included on that plan. So good discussion, good uh, back and forth uh, feedback. And um, that's the end of report. Our, our, I'll, I'll mention, sorry, our next, uh, we do have meetings scheduled this rem remainder of the year in August. Okay, moving on to agenda item number seven. Uh, we have two additional meetings coming up uh, later this year, one on August 18th um, and one on November 7th. I'd like to be uh, included in with the future agendas. Pat, it's not an um, agen additional agenda item, but it is a question. Um, do we know if these August and November are going to continue to be allowed to be over uh, virtual, or are there going to be in person? Because I know that there's an August that may prevent a quorum if it can't be virtual. Maybe not, but. Okay, we will um, converse with council on that. Uh we will confirm uh, with council and, uh, and let the board know. It's a good, good point. In the other item, number eight. Okay, Pat, moving I on a, to- I have, I have a suggestion, Pat, for uh, um, item seven. I, I think it might be worthwhile looking at um, what things we want to change in. Um, because we have the resourcing, what areas do we want to examine kind of a, an area for consideration? Maybe it's premature until the LRPC has a chance to really take a look at it, Chris. But I, I think uh, looking at, you know, are there any things that we need to go back and look at how our operating manual works for, and areas that we want to look? And it kind of goes to that long range strategy as well. But it's as we look forward, what is it that we want to do beyond next gen 911? Not that it's not a huge project and what we have, but where else do we want to be looking at in the future? So, what is 20 our positioning uh, to maybe uh, enact or affect that uh, as we go forward? Okay, good point, Mitch. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, strategic. Any other items from the board? Uh, it's All right, enough, here we maybe just to clarify on that, then to make sure that there is support from the board to, um, I don't probably not an agenda item for the board necessarily, but for the that strategies that would be a, a good agenda item to maintain there. Okay, thank you. Any other items, any other comments from the board? 
Okay, Mr. Medigovich, back to the to the stage uh, to provide a statement. Mitch? Hey guys, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of you, the work that you're doing and the work that you've done. Uh, I'm extremely proud to have been part of such a um, great team and a great group and uh, what you do uh, for public safety and to care for uh, citizens of California is truly remarkable uh, across the to um, leave my current position. And um, I don't know what niche 3.0 is going to look like, so you won't see my smiling face for a while. Um, I do not have a, a successor yet uh, established by the governor's office, but I just want to uh, long term um, for what you're doing and, and the difference that you're making every day. Uh, this board has a true impact uh, with it, and I, I applaud all of your efforts and I just want to say uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you, Mitch. And, you know, from a public safety communications and the 911 branches perspective, I can assure your counsel and your um, you're going to bat for us, uh, you know, to get a lot of stuff done. The Setna, uh, clearly the Setna language through that are going on to support this and the, the micro and upgrading the microwave network and uh, the radio communication system. So, you know, from thank you so very much for your time, your leadership and your dedication to the state of California. Uh, any other comments from the board before we move it on to open public yeah, comment? Brunner, I just want to thank you for your service. Um, I know when I came on the board, you had a lot of information and you kind of gave me quite an overview of what to expect and the expectations. Mitch, I want to um, echo Brenda's comments. Um, you know, you are very um, high up in the leadership level, and I always appreciated that you uh, treated everyone with respect. And um, through your leadership, a lot has happened uh, for 911. So, you know, as a director of a PSAP, I want to express my thanks on behalf of, of the 911. Okay, any other comments? Any Hearing none and seeing none, um, as I said, the next meeting will be in August, on August 18th, and we will have uh, ability to continue with virtual meetings. So great suggestion there, Leanne. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Do we have a motion, motion? to adjourn? Okay, motion by Brenda Brunner. Do we have a second? Second. Chief White. I'm sorry. Who was that? Chief White. Thank you, sir. Um, Chief, what time did you? I, I apologize. I believe it's 1044. 1044. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so we have a motion by uh, Ms. Brunner, a second by Chief White. Um, is there any objection? None. Then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.